ثم يحييكم ثم إليه ترجعون صدق الله مولانا العظيم وقال جل جلاله وعما نواله في شان حبيبه مخبرا وآمرا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد مع ذل الجود والكرم وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم وصل عليه In our previous section we went through a series of verses in which the essence of which Allah Azza wa Jal is calling us inviting us towards a relationship with him that is our ultimate purpose on this earth philosophers um, and different people from different walks of life will um, uh, misdirect you to other purposes in life but whatever purpose you identify that purpose is ancillary the real purpose of your our existence on this earth is to form a relationship with Allah and that relationship isn't just based on <coughs> informal tenets there are formal there's a formal framework as to how to engage in that relationship but then that formal framework doesn't mean that <coughs> it is rigid or the path is rigid Allah azza wa jal is inherently accommodating to diversity and he has created us the human race in diversity and that's why he says وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا When you persevere in my way وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا When you persevere in my way لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ Now, the English language doesn't have It's a very dry language It doesn't have emphasis in the way Arabic, Urdu or Farsi has so, if I translate it into English, you would think, why repeat yourself? But that repetition is an emphasis. You can understand that emphasis in Urdu, because Urdu accommodates emphasis. So, now, if you translate that into English, we will indeed, indeed give hidayat. If you speak to an English person and say, I will do this, indeed, indeed, he'll say, why do you need to even say indeed once? Just say, I want to do it. But if you really are, uh, you know, um, uh, stuck in the Victorian ages, then one indeed should suffice. But why indeed, indeed? It's, it's just simply not uh, uh, something that's um, a thing. But... We have to be alert of the sensitivity of Allah's kalam that when he says, I will indeed, and his emphasis is not to bind him in any way because Allah, inna Allah la yukhliful mi'ad, Allah doesn't go behind his promises. But it is to emphasize in our mind, zurur bi zurur ham dikhayenge, ham hidayat denge, subulana, apne rasto me se rasto. They, not one way, many ways. There are many ways to Allah. But that many ways, it doesn't mean that now someone can approach Allah through shirk or through uh, um, uh, uh, any other means. The deen is Islam. Once you in, engage in this framework, then from there onwards, then it becomes informal. The formality is, is the framework of the deen. The framework of, you know, you must accept this, you must do this, you must... But then beyond, what people do is that they misunderstand that the whole of their relationship with Allah is a formal relationship. It's actually not formal. Once you entrench yourself in the formalities of deen, thereafter it becomes an informal um, affair. Hazrat, there was a very great wali Allah by the name of Hazrat Maruf Karhi, very 
old before the time of <coughs> uh, Hazrat Junaid Baghdadi and Bayezid Bustami and Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, well before that time. Hazrat Ma'roof Karhi. And Ma'roof Karhi had reached a stage in Wilaya where Allah Azza wa Jal would <coughs> um, converse with him uh, through inkishaf, not the way he did with Anbiya, but through uh, inkishaf. As he conversed with animals in the Quran, you can see, or as he conversed with other uh, elements, but through wahi, it's, uh, it's not the same. So Allah Azza wa Jal said to Ma'roof, Shall I tell your secret to people as to how close you are to me, and in jealousy they will stone you? So Ma'roof Karhi heard this in Kishaf, and his response was, Fine. You tell my secret and I'll tell your secret. You tell my secret and I'll tell your secret. So Allah Azza wa Jal said, Oh Maruf, which secret of mine will you tell? He said, I will tell your people what kind of a Rahim and Kareem you are and no one will ever prostrate to you because they know you are so kind. Now this is a state of informality. This is not a state of, uh, 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 you know, oh, it only, you know this, I told you last time, we have turned this Allah into a Na'uzubillah, a rigid monster. No, he's very accommodating, he's very understanding. But we have turned him into this. Like Sayyidah Arabia Basriya says one day, Oh Allah, I want to see you. And Allah says, have you not heard in the, read in the Quran what I said to Musa Kalimullah, Lan Tarani, you cannot see me. And she said, he is um, uh, Kalimullah and I am Rabia. And why would you say that? She's not answering the question. This is love. For the same reason as I mentioned last time, in love the rules change. <clears throat> on a day where prophets will tremble on the Day of Judgment, voices will be heard uh, 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 shouting at Allah. And who dares, says the Prophet shout at Allah on the Day of Judgment, of all days on the Day of Judgment. Those children who were uh, born or did not uh, uh, reach uh, 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 life on this earth um, and they died before puberty, they will say to Allah in a very abrupt and shouting way, we will not go to Jannah until you don't take our parents with us. How dare they shout to Allah, they are children, but it is not shouting as anger as we would, it's in, a, in a, a love, in piyar. You know, uh, um, you know, it's like a child says to his father, Come here right now, shouts at the child. And the father becomes very happy. Look, my one-year-old child shouted at me. And yet he doesn't look at the fact that, how dare you shout at me. You know, but the, the, in that shouting, in that anger, there is love. So the framework is formal. The entry is formal. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. You need to establish prayer, give zakat, all this. But then the arena after that is very informal. We'll show you one of our many ways. So we established last time that these verses are all about one theme. And that theme is having a relationship with Allah. That's our purpose in life. You know, how may, ask yourself this question honestly. How many times in your life have you picked up your hands and said, Oh Allah, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to know you. I want to be close to you. Not close as in just symbolically close. I want to know you. I want to know who you are. I want You are my creator. Have you had that discussion with him? Or has it just been, you know, uh, a conversation based on need? And there's nothing wrong with that conversation. The, oh, I need this. I need this. I need this. I need this. There's nothing wrong with that. Because after all, who are you going to ask if you're not going to ask Allah? So Allah, you should ask Allah. But Allah is not just there to uh, be asked in times of need, his uh, desire is that he wants to be known. And what was that share I said last time? Tum se ulfat ke taqaze na nibhaye jate, vanna hamko bhi tamanna thi ke chahe jate. Allah wants to be known. Allah wants to be, but we just simply couldn't fulfill the uh, uh, protocols of uh, uh, love. So, um, having said all of those things about, come, I want a relationship with you, I will give you this, I will 
I made for you. Uh, 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 the verse emphasis uh, in the verse was everything was made for you. And then having said that, given all the incentives, he then says, In the la la yastahi, an yadriba mathalan ma ba'udatan fama fawqaha. Allah Azza wa Jal, this translator has written a good translation actually. Uh, sometimes translations um, can be inaccurate, but this translation I just read. Uh, Indeed, Allah is not ashamed to use the similitude of things, even as low as a um, mosquito. I don't, I don't agree with that. As low as a mosquito, as well as the highest. <clears throat> you see, the munafiqeen, they objected to Allah's, we, we use this word in Urdu and Arabic, darbul amsal, proverbs. So the munafiqeen, they said God uses proverbs. The usage of proverbs is an informal uh, uh, state. You know, you wouldn't find proverbs in a statute. You wouldn't find prover proverbs in, a, in an accountancy manual or in a dentistry manual. <laughs> you wouldn't find, because prover proverbs are designed to strike a chord of informality and Allah Azza wa Jal uses an informal tone in the previous verses we saw and when those verses were revealed the munafiqeen said this doesn't befit Allah to give darbul amsal proverbs you know it's like you are um, uh, um, you are <clears throat> uh, shining your face is shining like the moon Shining like the moon is a is a darbul amsal. Then Allah revealed this verse and says, "No, Allah is not uh, ashamed of la yastahi an yadriba mathlan ma baudatan." Whether it's, I don't agree with this translation that he says as low as the mosquito. There's no word here which says as low as ma baud. But what it says is, I can give you an example of something as small as a mosquito or even bigger than that. So what Allah is saying, listen, it's my creation. I can give you any example. But the point is, I, I am engaging with you in a, an informal tone. And cast your minds back. What does this verse, which, you know, we divided the Quran into four parts. Which four parts does this verse belong to? Keep that in the back of your mind, then you can answer. Those people who have Iman in them, they ponder over those examples and they say, no, this is right. However, they use any excuse by uh, uh, undermining, trying to undermine, not undermine, and trying to undermine these examples and, 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 and undermine therefore the Quran. At this juncture then Allah says, listen, the text or the meaning of the text does not automatically generate hidayah. Why? Yudillu bihi kathiran wa yahdi bihi kathira. If, you, if I translate this first in Urdu, Bohot sare is se, and what is the murad of is, what is the... Um, Misdaq of is, is, that's the Quran. Bohot sare aise hain, jo Quran se gumrahi hasil karte hain. Quran se. It's very odd. Or, wa yahdi bihi kathira. Or, bohot aise hain, jo is se hidayat. So, the Quran invites us to understand the prospect that there will be a generation of people prevalent in every community and every generation who will read the Quran but will be misguided and that misguidance is based upon uh, several tenets one of them is the de is a defect in their actual Iman but the fact that the Quran announces that there are those who will read the Quran and are misguided 
that should send alarm bells in our mind because we should ask ourselves a very honest and sincere question and that is on what basis do I proclaim that my understanding of the Quran is correct and I am guided by it and the other one isn't do you see what I'm trying to say you see I'm not talking about a, a, a difference of opinion in fiqh we've already established that that the fiqh uh, that we have in the sharia we have has an inbuilt mechanism of flexibility and accommodation that even if your ijtihad that you follow is wrong you will be rewarded for it so there's no problems with following a <coughs> an ijtihad an ijtihad the question here is not this dal mudil gumrahi. This is not based on fiqh. This is based on aqaid. So you dillu bihi kathiran wa yahdi bihi kathira. Let me remind you of a hadith which I had the honor of reciting to you um, uh, in the early sessions. It is contained in the muqaddimah of Sahih Muslim. Where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "In the fil bahri shayateen, under the seas, there are many shayateen, jinnat. For science, fire and smoke, uh, fire and water cannot coexist. Water will dominate fire, but this creation made of smoke less fire. Fire, nevertheless." has the capacity to exist underwater. This is something that the hadith teaches us. So he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the fil bahri shayateen, in the, the oceans they are shayateen. Masjoonatun awthaqaha Sulaiman. Hazrat Sulaiman Alayhi Salam has uh, uh, entrapped them and uh, entangled them in chains uh, as a Punishment. I'm not going to talk about Sulaiman al-Islam now. The verses pertaining to Hazrat Sulaiman al-Islam are coming forward. But in, in essence, Sulaiman al-Islam was uh, part of his jurisdiction was animals and jinns. Not every prophet uh, 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 necessarily was sent towards uh, humans, uh, sorry, jinns. S many were, but some were uh, uh, not. But Sulaiman al-Islam was, and there were shayateen, jinns amongst shaitans, specifically they were high-level shayateen, high-level jinns, who had used their magic to cause uh, turbulence and turmoil amongst people. So he had uh, entrapped them, enchained them under the ocean. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Yushiku an tukhraj. The time is very near that these shayateen will be released. So their release date is very near. Now when they come back into uh, upon, on the earth, the question is what form do they come? And I have told you in previous lectures that there are three kinds of jinns. We can see one that are permanently in their original uh, uh, state and they walk on the earth. They, that's nothing else, they walk on the earth. Then there are those who have the ability to be airborne. They can travel, they can fly to use a better expression. They can travel uh, and their traveling is not limited by the elements that restrict us like oxygen or gravity or these things. The Quran says, وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَسَابِيحَا وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رُجُومًا لِلشَّيَاطِينَ And these stars are, act as stones, as barriers for shayateen who circulate in the heavens. So these are like, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, the stars, one of the functions of stars is that they guard uh, uh, the earth and they uh, uh, protect the earth in many ways. Rujuman, they are the act of stones. Rujuman lishayateen. Wa'atadna lahum azab as Anyway, so the Prophet said, so, so, the, so the second kind of jinn is the one that is airborne, can fly. 
The third kind of jinn is the jinn who has the ability to come in any form he or she, and I emphasize she because there is gender amongst, thankfully only two genders amongst jinns. I don't think the LGBT community have quite penetrated the, uh, the community of jinns. Well, I certainly haven't seen a queer jinn, but you know, uh, 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 they, are gen uh, they are protected from being male and female. Uh, so, uh, uh, <laughs> they, he or she has the ability to come in any form. The fact is that they have a, a sense of preference towards reptilian image uh, uh, forms. You know, they can come in any form. They can come in the form of uh, a donkey. They can come in the form of a, an elephant. But they seem to be more drawn towards reptiles. For what reason? I don't know. That's why the Prophet Wasallam. there was actually a guy, uh, he, he believes that uh, these reptiles are aliens. What's his name? David who? Iki. Iki. Okay, tell Iki. Well, let's just say Iki then. Not Iqbal, Iki, Iki, Iqbal, but Iki. Iki, I, someone sent me a thing. He, he thinks these reptilians are a, a reptiles, are, angel, um, are aliens, but no. The reality is that amongst the reptiles, so they come mainly as reptiles, but amongst the reptiles, one of their most favorite reptile is the snake. That's why the Prophet ﷺ in a hadith in Muatta Imam Malik says, do not kill the snakes of Medina Munawwara because most of them are jinnat. Do not kill them. And the rule is you can't just kill a snake just for the fun of it. You are only allowed to kill a snake if the snake is coming towards you. You can't go out of your way in snake hunting to kill them. Yeah, you cannot go out of your way because who knows that that snake could be a jinn and if you kill a jinn, then you know it's like killing someone then his family or her family will come after you. And that's where we have a lot of problems with uh, um, uh, uh, possessions or uh, uh, disturbances from amongst jinnah. So they come in human form. Now when the Sahaba heard that these shayateen are going to be released, they asked the Prophet ﷺ, well in which form will they come? Will they resume their original form? Or will they come in any other form? No. They will come in human form and the Prophet is a human form. And the Prophet said, what will their occupation be? They will not be laborers, carpenters, doctors, lawyers. They will come as ulama. Qur'ana. They will come as ulama who recite Quran to people. So someone merely reciting the Qur'an should not be taken to be automatically the bearer of guidance. There are those who uh, 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 quote the Qur'an, but kathir, not saleh. Now you will ask a very logical question. Well, uh, why is it then if you uh, do a, a, a statistical analysis, you will find there are more who are misguided or than those who are guided. And that statistical analysis, you don't need to physically do that. You can get that from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, um, My ummah will be divided into 73 sects, not on the basis of fiqh. All of them will go to Jahannam, not permanently, temporarily. Because there's a difference, there's two kinds of jannatis, those who are permanent residents who will never leave and there are those who are short-term tourists in Jahannam. So as he, uh, the Prophet says, كُلُّهُمْ فِي النَّارِ إِلَّا مِلَّةً وَاهِنَا Now it doesn't take a, a genius to work out, 72 is more than one. So why does the Qur'an, and the 72, the differences between them will not be that one will quote the Guru Granth Sahib and the other one will quote the Gita. They will all, all 73 will quote the Qur'an. So statistically, 72 is more than one. But the uh, uh, ulama of tafsir say that the reason why there is a balance is because the Prophet ﷺ in Sahih Muslim says this hadith. There's a hadith brings this hadith. There will always be a time in my ummah 
uh, where there will be people who are gathered on the haq, number one. And then in another hadith, he says, La tajtami'u ummati ala dalala. My ummah will never unite on dalala. So the unity of the ummah in the one is at the same level of the 72 who are in dalala. And that's why the Quran says, Yudillu bihi kathiran wa yahdi bihi kathira. Then it says, Wama yudillu bihi, Wama yudillu bihi, or nahi gumrahi pate or paenge. This is the present and future tense. Bihi illa al fasiqeen, except for the fasiqeen. Now there are two kinds, actually, the people of Tafsir, they uh, um, uh, define two kinds of, uh, three kinds of fasiqs, but for uh, ease, I would like to present to you two kinds of fasiqs which the Quran refers to and which makes it easier for us to understand. One group of fasiqs are kafirs, they are non believers. Okay? But there are another group of uh, uh, fasiqs who actually are believers but they commit fisk. Fisk means sin. And sin is of two kinds. One is an amali sin based on amal and one is an i'tiqadi sin based on belief. So their beliefs are so corrupted that that belief or to, to host that belief is fisk. Shall I give you an example on this? Uh, aqidah. The uh, majority or the ijma, and I say ijma very clinically, ijma means there is no scope for doubt. The ijma of the ummah is that there will be azab qabr Ijma. There is no third view on this. There will be punishment of the grave. Those who profess the notion that there will be no punishment in their grave, that aqidah is fisk. Because that aqidah is bid'ah. And the Prophet says, Kullu bid'atin dalala. Kullu, kullu bid'atin dalala. We normally, when we talk about kullu bid'atin dalala, that normally refers to actions. But what is not pointed out is that a, a bid'ah includes actions and beliefs. So kullu bid'atin dalala, kullu dalala fil nar, and that dalala will take you towards jahannam. And again, not necessarily uh, uh, permanently. It won't be khulud fil nar permanently in nar. It will be temporarily because of the nature of the bid'ah. So here, the second kind of uh, 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 fasik is the one who has uh, the uh, framework of iman, but either his actions are actions of fisk sin, or his beliefs are actions of uh, uh, um, are actions which represent uh, uh, sin. And I can give you many, many more examples of this, but. I'm very conscious of time and I want to move on. And then, having talked about the uh, Fusaq, the people of Fisk, then Allah elaborates on one of their common denominators, which uh, 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 is the same feature you will find in a Mu'min who commits Fisk and a Kafir. There's a common denominator between both of them. And what is that common denominator? Alladheena these are those people who break their oath, uh, 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 who break the oath which they gave to Allah Azza wa Jal. What has he translated it as? And those who break Allah's promise after it is accepted. Yeah, so they accepted it. So. The, 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 this actually now is getting deeper into the human reality. <clears throat> if I say to you, you made a promise, you accepted an oath, you made a promise and you are going against it. What would your first question be? What would your first question be? When? I don't recall it. You, 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 are, you, are, you are blaming me or you are calling upon an oath which I am purportedly, which I have made, which, uh, 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 which um, you know, is, is, um, uh, 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 is not fair. How can I be held liable for something that I, 
I don't even recall. But Allah is jogging our memory and saying to us, you have given an oath. And this is not just the people of Fisk. These are all humans. These are all humans. So from the perspective of this verse, the human race can be divided into two parts. Those who upheld their oath with Allah and those who didn't uphold their oath with Allah. So the question is, when did we have an oath with Allah? I don't think anyone can clearly say that I remember having an oath with Allah. But this verse is now inviting you to explore your reality and say, you should ask the question, when? And if you don't ask that question and you just carry on reading, then you're not focusing on what the author is trying to say to you. He's saying you've given an oath. And you, immediately your answer should be, well, when? I don't recall giving an oath. So I want to know about this oath that I have given me, not people on behalf of me. Me, I have given this oath. I want to know about it. Are you, is that fair? You want to know about this oath that you're given. So now in order to find out about this oath, you have to start diving into your reality. The problem is science only offers us an understanding of our reality limited to two pieces of paper. Two pieces of paper, which in the grand scheme of things, those two pieces of paper, sorry to use this terminology, in the, when you understand the grand scheme of things, those two pieces of paper are no different to toilet roll because they define who we are without an understanding of our reality. And what's those two pieces of paper? One is a document called date of uh, birth certificate and one is called the death certificate. And science has imprisoned us in this existence and says, this is who you are from the day you are born and from the day you die. That's it. Before that you have no existence and after that you have no existence. Because there is no data that science can refer to and, uh, and, and corroborate an existence before and an existence afterwards. But then when science is asked questions about a previous life, science doesn't know. Would you like an example? Please, Google this and don't take my word for this. Once upon a time there was only one uh, 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 um, YouTube link which I referred to now there's so in fact uh, someone referred uh, uh, me to a film that's been made it's even available on Netflix I think it's called it's, it's a documentary um, it's about death uh, life and death I don't know the name of it but I'm sure if you Google it, it's a documentary about life and death different people different perspectives in that there's a whole episode and you, you must watch this because he, he, as a Muslim, you must ask yourself this question. How has my Lord explained this? Because any explanation we have will be from the Quran and the Sunnah. So in that particular episode, there are many episodes to that documentary. There is one episode where a child is born and he recollects the character of a previous person. Yeah, who's already died? I mean, the first two examples I used to give was uh, a child whose father was changing his nappy. And the, uh, the child said to his father, Father, you are changing my nappy. I used to change your nappy. So the father started laughing and says, How did you change my nappy? He said, I changed your nappy. He said, No, 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 you're joking. He said, no, I changed your nappy. And he, the child started talking as if he was the father of this person, even though he was talking as a father of his father. Anyway, and one day, so this just to, to, to test, and this is not something, or this is not even something that uh, uh, is presented by Muslims, so that someone can say, oh, well, this is a concoction. Not Muslims. The father showed a picture of a vehicle to the little boy and said, what's this? And the little boy, two-year-old boy, said, that's my first car. And that car was the first car which that person's father had. How did a two-year-old child know 
that this was your father's first car. How did they know? Science has no understanding of that. Then there's a child who talks about his other family. And psychologists are absolutely, you know, they are, they, 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 they are baffled. How can a child talk about a previous person who existed? Now, please, don't take my word for it. Go and watch it. Because there is a proper documentary on this. And YouTube has many examples of this. Where you have a child has a memory of a previous life. There's one child who talked graphically about him dying in a plane crash in World War II. And the graphic details he gave, he told the names of his friends, fellow pilots. He had technical information about planes at the age of 3-4. How's that possible? The point I'm trying to make is, science doesn't have an answer. Science says, oops, that shouldn't be right. How is that possible? That you know someone about Joe Bloggs who existed 30 years before you. Okay? So that's before birth. Then after birth, um, science has no understanding of why it is that we continue to see people who have died when we go to sleep. Science doesn't have that overall comprehensive understanding. It's, it's an evolutionary process of trying to understand, but it's not absolute in its understanding. So, the point I want to make is that in this verse, Allah is, you know, it's like me saying to you, um, you say, um, what shall I write with? I say, can you write, can you write something down? I say, you say, what should I write with? So, whatever's in your pocket. I don't know why this um, microphone is misbehaving today. Um, is it the mic? I thought it doesn't like me. Um, uh, sorry, what was I saying? Yeah, I say to you, you say, uh, uh, right, as in, write. Write with whatever is in your pocket. You say, what's in my pocket? How do you know what's in my pocket? So here Allah is saying, you've made an oath to me. And your immediate response must be, me? Oath? No, I don't recall. Now if you don't recall, which is the case, right? Then you must ask yourself this question. Well, then you must ask yourself this question. Well, when did I make this oath? I want more information about this. Because I am being held liable for an oath which I don't remember. I want more information. And that's the purpose of this whole ayah. Come, I'll tell you. Don't you, doesn't it stimulate your mind? Oath, promise, you, yes, you. And you made it directly with Allah. There wasn't any third person. And the Quran educates us. Come, I'll tell you. But in order to know this, you need to understand your reality. And what is your reality? This promise you made was made at a time when you, your existence did not have bodily form. So Allah is automatically telling us that your existence doesn't revolve around this piece of meat. Your existence was there even before this piece of meat. And in that existence you made a promise which you are being held liable for now. Isn't that a bit unfair? If Allah would have preserved the memory of that uh, 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 um, occasion, then fair enough. No one's got an excuse. But Allah wants us to embark upon this journey of self-discovery. Who, when, what, how? He says, come, I'll tell you. It's all there. He says, and we're going to come on to those verses later, but I, I want to create a picture for you. Adam alayhi salam, when he came upon this earth, Allah Masaha ala zahrihi kama yaliku shani. Allah rubbed his back according to his majesty. How he did it, we cannot graphically describe, but according to his majesty, he rubbed the back of Adam alayhi salam. And from within the loins of Adam alayhi salam, from within his back, 
uh, uh, emerged two groups of people, one from the right, one from the left. And that was the entire human race. Why left, why right? Well, the Hadith tells us those who came out from the right, they were the people of Jannah, and those who came from the left were people from, of Jahannam. But then that raises a further problem, not problem, but a question about fate. Well, if I was taken out from the left, well, then why am I bothering with all of this? My fate is sealed. No, it doesn't work like that. Ultimately, we will talk about Qadr when the verses of Qadr come properly. So, but do bear this in question in your mind because it's a very good uh, uh, question to ask. Well, if my fate is sealed, if everything has been written, why am I wasting my time here? So uh, 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 Allah took out the souls. There was no discrimination at that time. There was no demarcation. There was conscription. There was like soldiers. There was order. There was, you know, it wasn't chaos. I mean, you have 10 people in a room. And if they're not organized, there'll be chaos. Here we're talking about trillions of souls. In fact, such was the magnitude of these souls that even the angels looked at the earth and said, uh, how are these people going to fit into this small patch of land called planet Earth? Oh, the scientific word is Pangaea. It was an island, Pangaea. How, how is this entire population going to fit on this earth? The angels asked Allah a question. This is a hadith. And Allah Azza wa responded, to accommodate this entire uh, uh, human race on this small island of Pangaea, I have created death. That's why they won't all live at the same time. They will come in stages. So Allah takes out all of the human race from Adam and Islam. When he takes them out, it wasn't you know, just a... Uh, a two minute thing, no, he takes, eh, now picture yourself, you were there, and you have to ask yourself, I was there, really, me, I'm being told about my existence, which I don't remember, I want to know more, so I came out of Adam alayhis body, and when a child is born, you don't have an intellectual conversation with a child, why, because a child doesn't have proper cognitive faculties, has a, a, a learning inabilities, and that's because it's a child. Infancy, that's what infancy is. Doesn't have the ability to speak, kalam. But the, that is the case of the body, not of the soul. When these souls came out, Allah didn't say, right, all go to college, all learn your language. No. As soon as they came out, there was a congregation if you allow me to use the word ijtima or jalsa, there was a jalsa organized and Allah Azza wa Jal himself presided over that jalsa. And he asked the entire human race, Alastu birabbikum, am I not your Lord? Now, science tells us that when something is born, it doesn't have the capacity to think or it doesn't have cognitive uh, 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 um, faculties as it does when it develops. This question, alastu bi rabbikum, is a very technical question. It's not who is your creator, it's not who is your ilah, worthy of worship. The question is who is your rab? Rab means sustainer. That's a very technical question. You ask a little child, who sustains you, the child can't answer that question because it doesn't understand sustenance. But the question is a very technical question. And look at the uh, uh, nature of the question. It isn't, uh, who is your Lord? It's not, who is your Lord? Am I not your Lord? So the assumption is, you know the answer, but I am asking you this question to emphasize. Um, so Allah says, Alastu bir, and every one of us replied, I won't say with our this tongue, but with the tongue of our existence. Then, Qalu Bala, they said yes. And then the next ver, uh, part of the verse is, Shahidna, we bear witness so that on the day of judgment we can hold you to this. Am I not your Lord? So, 
in that populace that said yes, there were people like Joseph Stalin, there were people like Adolf Hitler, there were people like Mao Zedong, there were all the, the great butchers of history. They all acknowledged Allah's Rububiyyah. But the question you have to ask is what went wrong? By default, every soul, every human acknowledged Allah. And that is why Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْشَنِ التَّقْوِيمِ we, we created you as the best of qawm, the best of creation. So, we created you as the best. You, But then what went wrong? Why did you then... Uh, 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 go, so these are questions we have to ask yourself. Well, what went wrong? I was, you know, no one is born evil. This concept which Hollywood has given us that some people are born evil. No. no. By default, all humans, non Muslims included, are created in a state of perfection. That's quite paradoxical, uh, contrary to what uh, philosophers and liberal thinking philosophers have said. Thomas Hobbes says, uh, in his, uh, 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 I think Leviathan, his book, he says, man in a state of nature is a beast. So, when he comes to civil society, he becomes civilized. That is the position of the secular world. Man in a state of nature is a beast. When he comes to civil society, he is civilized. The Quran says, man in a state of nature is perfect. When he comes to civil society, he degenerates those values. And the only way to revive those values of perfection is Iman and Amle Saleh. You want to go back to where you were? Perfect? Yep, go back. This is the way Iman and Amle Saleh. So we made a an oath to Allah that yes, we will uphold, and that's why at different junctures of the Quran, Allah, and that it wasn't just an oath, there was a detailed conversation which Allah had with us about our life to be. And Allah says, uh, Surah Yasin, Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani Adam. Did we not have a, a, a deal? Ahad kya hamne ahad ne kiya? Alam ahad ilaykum in this ahad, this is a question mark. Hamza istifhamiya. Kya hamara wada nahi tha? Did we not have a deal? Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani Adam. Allah ta'budu shaitan. Don't follow or worship shaitan. Innahu lakum aduwum mubeen. So Allah conversed with us in that state, even told us about shaitan. So in our instinct, shaitaniyat was placed as, in, as a deterrence, that this is wrong. That's why when a child does something wrong, you know, the parent reminds the child that this is wrong, but the child knows that this is wrong, whatever reason it does is what it does. But the reality is, we, that uh, instinctive understanding of right and wrong is ingrained in us. Who ingrained that instinctive state in us. Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's why he says, there are three kinds of hidayah. I'm not going to talk about that now. That's why he says, رَبُّنَ الَّذِي رَبْ وَوْهَ الَّذِي Allah is He أَعْتَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى He gave everything its existence and then guided it. Who guided a, a female bee B, a female B, that upon its birth, it should fight its sister to death. Do you know that? When a female, not male, oh yes, nature testifies, a female B, and this is not being in any way sexist, this is na how nature is. Ask Sir David Attenborough if you don't believe me. And when a female bee is born 
At the same time, her sister is born. She engages, as soon as she's born, the first thing she does, she doesn't eat, she doesn't sleep. She has a contest, a fight with her sister, and the fight is to death. The question I ask you is, who ingrained that protocol in that bee's mind? رَبُّنَ الَّذِي أَعْتَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى this is hidayat amma Allah has distributed this in the entire existence of this uh, 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 universe. The proton, electron, neutron, it, 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 it uh, um, follows a certain protocol. Who instilled that protocol? Allah Azza wa Jal. Hada, thumma hada. Allah guided, you must. But then when I tell you, you can defy that protocol and behave in, in another way. So. Allah Azza wa Jal has told us that, look, you have made a promise and we have had discussions. So this is an, a, 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 an invitation to you that, look, come, I'll tell you more about yourself. Come, come, come. Don't rely on science. Listen to science. Don't ignore science. I'm not one of those people, hotheads who say, oh, ignore science. Hey, science doesn't have a clue. No. Science and the sincere scientist is following the uh, 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 methodology of the Quran. Why? He wants to know the truth, and she wants to know the truth. If a scientist wants to, the problem comes when a scientist becomes arrogant and says, what I know is the truth, and there is no other truth. That's where the problem comes. But as long as a scientist is open-minded and says, no, look, I have discovered X, Y, and Z through the power of a formula, but if you are able to Allow me a greater understanding than I'm, but of course, when a science becomes, uh, uh, when a scientist becomes a, uh, a member of the secular methodology, then that changes their mindset. But when a scientist, a true Muslim, is a scientist, one who wants to know the truth, and so therefore, this is this verse is an invitation to you. Come find out about it. So I will tell you, the Fasiqeen are those who went back on their promise with Allah. وَيَقْتَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ And Allah ordered them to do X, Y, and Z and they uh, uh, broke that uh, 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 promise. And يُوسِلَ وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Now when this word يُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ comes, I ask myself this question, what does this refer to? At the top of the list, it refers to terrorism. Fasad fil ard. That's what terrorism is. Terrorism is a mindless, is a mindless onslaught which has no rational basis. I will kill you because I disagree with you or those who you are with. And those who are around you, whether they are women or children, I don't care. That's my objective. There's no rationale to terrorism but when certain uh, uh, Muslims carry out certain actions in order to undermine deen they attribute those people as Islamic terrorists have you ever heard the, the word Jewish terrorists or have you heard Christian terrorists or Hindu terrorists it almost is synonymous that when the word terrorist is used, it refers to a Muslim. But terrorism as a phenomena is one of the oldest um, uh, features of the human race from the first day of our existence. It's terrorism. Where there is no rational basis. What I ask you this question. When Kabil murdered his brother Hazrat Habil salam, was that murder for a just cause? Was that murder in defense? It was, there's no other word for it, it was terrorism. And that's what the angels talked about from day one because when we, saw, when we talk about Fasad Fil Ard, the top of the list is terrorism. But then when you come to the bottom of the list, you look at things like riba, backbiting, 
which we are oblivious to in our lives. Because we think, no, 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 I, I can never be a backbiter. No. Backbiting is an act in which you tell the truth about someone, but the objective is not to tell the truth to glorify them or honor them, it is to de glorify them. It is to put them down. Like, uh, in any way, however, like uh, a, a man came to the Prophet, he was short. He was short. So when he left, the Prophet said, Aisha said to the Prophet, he was very short. She wasn't lying, but the Prophet said, This is Ghiba. Yet, she was telling the truth. So being short per se is not a, a wrong. But when your objective is to de-honor someone, or the test is, if I would have said it in his presence, would it have uh, hurt him or her? Then yes. The problem with riba is that Allah does not forgive riba until and unless the person whom you have committed riba against has forgiven you. It's as simple as that. It's the same rule as Dain, as uh, uh, fiscal uh, 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 liabilities, where Allah will not extinguish your fiscal liability until that liability is fulfilled um, in the dunya or in the akhirah. Yeah. And a limited company, <laughs> the veil of incorporation. Uh, there are many ulama that talk about how a veil of incorporation can protect you. Some ulama are of the view that it can protect you in the hereafter, and some ulama say that no, it cannot protect you in the hereafter. The better view, and you can have any view you like, the better view of ulama is that the veil of incorporation does benefit you. Why? Because if you are trading with another entity on the understanding that this liability is going to be capped. And that cap is as long as the company is solvent. And that's the trading uh, understanding. It, you, 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 no one trades with a limited liability company or a limited liability partnership on the assumption that there is no cap. The understanding is that this is... And that's why people say to limited liability companies or limited liability partners, that in some instances we require a personal guarantee. And in an, a personal guarantee is a liability that goes to the grave or to the hereafter. But the veil of incorporation per se, but that doesn't mean to say now that we should form limited liability companies and shortchange people and say, oh, I'm, there's no skin on my neck in the cupboard or the hereafter. Ultimately, cheating is cheating. But you know, if for some reason your company went down, the gutter, it doesn't matter, there is a, a, a provision there. So, fasad fil ard, the top of the uh, thing is terrorism and something at the bottom. And when I say something at the bottom, don't disregard it to mean it's trivial. The Prophet ﷺ says in a, a hadith, Al ghibatu ashaddu min az zina. Ghiba is more heinous as a crime, serious as a crime than zina. Why? Because the act of zina has a beginning and an ending. When it ends, that liability ends at the time that action ends. But riba, the liability continues and, uh, uh, as, uh, until the person whom you have committed it against has not forgiven you. Can you see the seriousness of this? So, وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ and they do facade on this earth. These are losers. So Allah is saying, look, you know, the, the flip side is, losers are those who don't fulfill their promise with Allah. They, uh, uh, they do facade fil ard. And the flip side is, what are winners? Winners are those who fulfill their promises with Allah. And they don't do facade fil ard. So a terrorist cannot be in that group. You know, a person who calls himself a Muslim cannot be a terrorist. They, these two things don't. Uh, 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 it, it, it's like saying, uh, it's like, you know, in Bradford there was a yogurt that was introduced in the market called halal yogurt. So I asked the owner of that company, I said, when you say halal yogurt, is there such a thing as a haram yogurt? 
He says, no, 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 I'm just saying it's halal yogurt. But I said, is there such a thing as haram yogurt? And, and he was like, no, there isn't, but it's halal yogurt. But anyway, that was just a sales pitch. <laughs> so, uh, fasad fil ard, and I'm sorry, I'm going to use this opportunity to say something else. It's like those people who say Islamic democracy. Islamic democracy. That is the same expression as saying halal pig. Oh yes. Um, seriously. Can a pig ever be halal? It is najsi'ain. It is inherently haram. Can never be. You could wash a pig's meat in, uh, in water a thousand times but it will still be filth. It will be haram. It will still be haram. Um, so democracy, you know, I, I don't understand where this word Islamic democracy came from. Democracy, if you, and I don't want to do a lecture on democracy, but the, the, the literal meaning is demo, democracy, people power. On the face of it, it sounds very good. But when you look at the constituent elements of democracy, the first fundamental principle of democracy is that sovereignty lies with the people. Sovereignty lies with the people. But the Quran says, mulki mulka man Sovereignty lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if a whole group of people in the name of democracy challenged what Allah said, that won't make it right. Because that's what democracy is, isn't it? The majority is right. But Allah says sovereignty, there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, um, the, the Quran says وَمَشَاوِرُهُمْ فِي الْعَمَرِ You do mashra with each other but that mashra doesn't mean sovereignty lies with you. Uh, 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 the, the system of governance is a federal system. You know there's two systems isn't there? Uh, federal and what's the other one? Huh? Provincial. Provincial. Uh, more uh, accurate provi- um, political scientists, you, uh, they use the word. Um, there's federal system, and I think it's called a uh, unitary system. Is it? Is that right? Unitary system? Uh, in, in case I've got it wrong. But the difference between, let's say, American system of governance and um, British system of governance is that um, the, in the American system of governance, um, the federal system... Uh, Sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, In the federal system, the individual states give power to Washington. Sovereignty is transferred from the state to the sovereign. In a unitary system, the monarch or the ruler distributes power, like in England. In England, it's a unitary system. Uh, uh, Have you found the word? Is it unitary? I think it's devolved. Thank you very much. Devolved. Devolution. Thank you very much. Devolution is where the sovereign distributes power. So in the Quran, the concept of demo- uh, 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 sovereignty is devolution. Allah gives sovereignty to who he likes. Yeah. Allah gives sovereignty to who he likes. Uh, and that grant of sovereignty doesn't mean to say that that's now a, a, a blank check. As some uh, uh, rulers used to say, well, Allah made me a ruler, so I'm a ruler. No. <laughs> Allah may give sovereignty, but that is in amana. That is a, a, a source of test for you. So anyway, uh, 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 so it's like saying halal, no, um, Islamic democracy is exactly saying halal pig. There's no difference between the two. Democracy can never ever be reconciled with uh, uh, um, uh, Islam. And those people who promote uh, Islamic democracy are exactly in the same group of people as Akbar. King Akbar. You know Akbar? Akbar who tried to reconcile Hinduism and Islam. And who stood up to him? Hazrat Mujaddid al Fasani, Sheikh Ahmad Sin Hindi, alayhi rahmah. Hinduism and Islam can never, even with the best of intentions, they can never be reconciled. 
Yes, Christianity and Islam have a common point. The Quran alludes to that. But Hinduism, ipso facto, is uh, uh, irreconcilable with Islam. So sorry, I, I went to task on that because we live in an age where we have to apologize to the public and say, please don't say we're bad people, we're good Muslims, we're very peaceful, uh, loving citizens because we don't want MI5 after us and we, we don't want to be traced uh, in any way. We're very peaceful, loving people and, uh, and we believe in democracy and we, 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 you know, sorry. This kind of apologetic Islam breeds cowardice. It breeds a dastardly state of mind. It breeds um, uh, uh, slavery. The deen which Allah has given is where sovereignty starts with Allah and say, how dare you say you are my sovereign. Allah is my sovereign. And he is the one who will ultimately have my fate in his hands, not you. You can try to compromise the quality of my life. You can try to even take my life, but I will not compromise the principles of the Quran and Sunnah. So we have in this modern day and age the, uh, the rise of what I call the apologetic Muslim. Please don't be uh, angry with me. I'm a very peaceful, harmonious, loving people. You know, like some channels say, please, we are very harmonious, peaceful. We do not, you know, we believe in democracy. In fact, uh, to the best of my knowledge, and I, I stand to be corrected, um, Prevent, which was created by the government to prevent terrorism, in their documents I have read, and again, uh, I'm stand to, I stand to be, uh, uh, um, it was basically, Pre Prevent was just another agency of spies to try to, you know, root out terrorists. But, and who did they create spies from? In, amongst the Muslim community. It wasn't, you know, Hindus or Sikhs coming into the Muslim. It was create a spy, uh, 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 a, a, um, a, a group of spies from amongst the Muslims, give them a nice fat salary and say you work for Prevent. And, and, and the idea was basically grass upon your own. Anyway, that, that's not an issue. If someone is doing wrong, there's no problem with that. They're doing wrong. But in the literature of Prevent, it is written that if anyone does not uh, uh, promote democracy or says anything against democracy, that is terrorism. Subhanallah. Absolutely. You know, it's like you can't open your mouth about a Jew anymore because the moment you say Jewish people are this, it's anti-Semitism. No. If a Jew does something wrong, then as freedom of speech, you are entitled to say this is wrong, whether you are a Jew, Hindu, Sikh or whatever. But because you have said something wrong to a Jew, oh, it automatically becomes an anti-Semitism. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, um, the real, uh, sorry, I lost my chain of thought. What was I saying just a few minutes ago? MashaAllah. Basically, you can't say anything bad to a Jew. Because yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so we have to, to not come into the radar of prevent. We have to say, we believe in democracy. We believe in... We don't believe in democracy. Democracy is a piece of trash. We don't have any value for democracy. We believe in the sovereignty of Allah, whether MI5 likes it or not. Put us on any list you want. But we will not compromise our values only so that we are not on the radar of uh, 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 you know, a group of people who are obsessed in, um, in enslaving the human race in one form or another. But that doesn't mean to say that now we don't believe in democracy, we're, we're going to go out and we're going to uh, establish Khilafah tomorrow. Of course, our objective must be Khilafah. But you have to establish Khilafah upon your person first. The Prophet ﷺ didn't establish Khilafah overnight. He created people who were symbols of Khilafah. Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar al Farooq. You are, you, you are the sovereign. Allah has given you sovereignty over your body, your hands, your feet. And these are separate entities. They will give evidence against you. Yeah, Surah Yasin. I think I recited that verse. وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُنُمْ they will give evidence. Oh Allah, He made us do this. He made us do this. You are the ruler of this body. If you cannot is implement Islamic governance upon this body, then what kind of Islamic state are you going to create? Yeah. 
And then the second tier is you implement the Islamic principles of deen, not just of sharia, of deen upon those who are your ri'aya. Ri'aya means those who are in your governance. Who are they? Your family. Yeah, if you cannot establish deen amongst your family, then what kind of Islamic state are you? That doesn't mean to say, uh, by the way, we uh, uh, give up hope. No. Our objective must be our Allah. Our ultimate objective is Khilafah. We want Khilafah. And Khilafah ala minhaj al nabuwa not Khilafah ala uh, uh, minhaj al mulukiya as in which is a uh, uh, um, monarchy. A monarchy is not Khilafah ala minhaj al nabuwa But our objective is we want Khilafah, but before we want Khilafah, you know, it's no use going up to Allah on the day, uh, uh, when you die and say, Oh Allah, I was a member of Hizbut Tahrir and I all, all my life I said Khilafah, Khilafah, Khilafah. And Allah said, Allah will say, well, that's fine. To aspire to Khilafah is fine. But how did you implement deen upon your person? If you cannot implement or if your mind has not undergone Islamization, the problem is our mind has been contaminated by culture. And therefore, we are restricted from Islamization to the, to, 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 to the, to the optimum value. Because our cultural values have uh, 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 interfered. So Allah will say, well, where did the, that's why the Prophet ﷺ says in a Sahih Hadith, كُلُّكُمْ رَائِنْ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْعُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّةِ Your shepherds, and you'll be asked about your flock. You won't be asked, why didn't you go and fight in Palestine? There's no harm in going fighting in jihad in Palestine. You won't be asked, why did you not go and fight for your brothers and sisters in Hindustan or in Kashmir? No problem. If you do that, that's your choice. But you will be asked, what did you do to implement deen in your life and those who are around you? You see? And if you say, well, I asked them, I told them, and they didn't. No. You cannot give up. This is not a sales pitch that you're trying to sell something and once you've sold it, that's it. No. Your objective is to continue to try. The problem is we give up. We say, oh, I, I spoke to my uncle. He doesn't agree. No, that's it. I've, I've, I, he's off my Facebook. He's off my this. He's off. No. If you've given up on your family, then who will take responsibility of them? Allah will ask you, what did you do? And just to say, well, I, I invited him or her to come. That's not good enough. No. Your whole emphasis in your life must be that you must be an ambassador of deen. And so therefore, uh, the Islamic State is our objective, whether MI5 likes it or not. But what we say is that this is not the uh, uh, occasion where we are able to implement uh, uh, the Islamic Khilafah. Why? Because the Muslims themselves are so defective in their understanding of deen. That if they ever implemented a Khilafah, it would be an absolute shambles. Why? Because if you look at the drop down list, some of the most intolerant people on this earth are Muslims. Some of the most racist people on this earth are Muslims. Some of the most arrogant people on this earth are Muslims. Doesn't Islam come to counter these values? How can I suggest that I have the privilege of ruling if I suffer from those diseases myself? The problem, is, and this is why Allah Azawajal selects certain people who have certain values. And those values and, and, and the selection of Khilafat Usmaniya, the Turkish uh, uh, people, even today you can see, I haven't met, and I could be wrong, I haven't met a Turkish person who, is, who I found to be racist. You know, I, 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 I find, I'm just giving an example. I'm not saying this applies to all Turkish people. But what I'm saying is that certain races are amenable to certain diseases. Yeah? But what we have to ask ourselves is what disease am I amenable to? What diseases are at my door? And if I don't know the diseases I suffer from, what kind of deen am I going to implement? You know, if I, uh, you know, dress up with a facade of deen and I go and have a mindset of a barbarian, or of, a, or of an anarchist, or of a, 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 a narcissist. What kind of a, a, a deen am I going to uh, represent? The Prophet ﷺ waited 40 years to announce his nabuwa. Why? Why couldn't he announce his nabuwa at the age of five? Why 40 years? 
because he established his characteristics at a pedestal that every human being could relate to. So that even Abu Jahl said, no, well, Amin, he is Al Amin. Even the most heinous person in Meccan society said, no, he is of good character. He's of good character. So he established his character. And on the strength of that character, he promoted his deen. We do it the other way. We promote deen first. And when it comes to good character, we say, oh, well, we don't know about that. Good character and deen must come in hand, hand, hand in hand. You know, I, 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 I see people who live in diabolical conditions, you know, unclean conditions. Or their whole person is unclean. And I say, well, where did the hadith al nidhafatu min al-Iman go? That cleanliness is, is part of Iman. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that we do not compromise our principles. We do aspire for لِيُزْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ kulli That Allah's deen will prevail. We are not waiting for Imam Mahdi. Whenever he comes, he comes. We know he's going to come. But we are asking ourselves the question, what can we do to prepare ourselves for the advent of Dajjal? Because if we do not prepare for that eventuality, then all we are going to be left with is when Dajjal comes, performs a few miracles, that's it, we're going to be sucked in. You know, I asked someone, someone one day, what in your mind is the, um, is the hallmark of a wali? You know, a wali Allah. He said someone who performs miracles. That's, you know, what is a wali Allah? He says someone who performs miracles. I said, well, in that case, you have to accept Dajjal is a wali Allah. Because he will perform miracles. If your criteria of haq is the performance of miracles, well, the Jalvas will do that. A dead body will be in front of him and he will say, Come! The dead body will rise. And what more of a miracle do you want? He will say, Rain! And it will rain. What more of a miracle do you want? But it's not the performance of miracles that makes you a person of Quran. It is the uh, uh, characteristics which were promoted by Deen as to how much, you know, you know, people ask me, what is your uh, test of a person's religiosity, religiosity or religiousness? To say, this person is religious. How do we weigh that? That he reads namaz, roza, hajj, zakat? Huh? Sorry. I'll tell you the formula I use. I see how much that person attaches himself or herself to secular values. Advertently or inadvertently. Because sometimes we could be uh, uh, echoing secular values without realizing it. We could be echoing secular values because that's the system of education that we've been brought up in. We are sometimes inadvertently doing that. So the only way out of that is come back to the Quran. The Quran is the only mechanism through which you will allow your mind and thought and heart to be purified. Humul khasirun, these are the losers. So the flip side is, if you want to be the winners, find out about yourself. Find out about that oath. Uphold that oath that you gave to Allah Azza wa Jal. Wa ma'alayna illa al